What's cracking, everybody? My name's Smart Guy, Matt Zapoli here for the Gotcha Book Tour here in Miami. So we started in Chicago, we've been to Atlanta, we've been to Memphis, we've been to Orlando, and now we are in Miami. It was crack a everybody. Money smart guy, Matt Zipali here. Hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. Yes, that video was from Miami, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, and Hollywood area combined. Which came back from the Gotcha Book Tour over there this past weekend. And uh, back now in Dallas, Texas here to host this Seven Figure Squad podcast here with my host, Milton Alvarez, in studio. And uh, we have a show here for you. A couple, uh, actually, we have about five or six topics here. So, uh, resident doctor, we're going to be covering here. A resident doctor doing her thing. Becoming a full-fledged doctor, but she's right now in residency. But she's going to crack down her budget, and we're going to see what she has left after her responsibilities. Uh, everyone should have a home, this uh, presidential candidate says. Everybody should have a home, have their debt paid off, and have a $10,000 a month income. Everybody in America, how would you love that? We're going to be covering this. Uh, Warren Buffett cut this particular stock, particular stock from the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. And by the way, he loves life insurance. But he cut this insurance stock from his portfolio, and that stock immediately dropped 51% in one day. We're going to discuss why. Wife spends down husband's savings account without his permission to pay off her student loan debt. We're going to be reacting to that video. Uh, Milton, you got a couple of topics here on, on, uh, on health, and, health and wellness. Bro, I'm, I'm about to turn my parts of this podcast into myth busting Wednesdays, man. There's a lot of myth myths. busting Wednesdays. Okay. There's a lot of myths out there, a lot of misinformation that many of us have carried on for so many I years, like that. man. And one of them is for a lot of people who are in the fitness world or who are working with a coach or a trainer, or you are a trainer yourself, is does six meals a day really boost your metabolism and what you should focus on to meet your fitness goals instead? Okay. And the second thing, you know, many people always ask you, do you have what it takes to win? But at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, what is considered winning in your personal life, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, and what does it come with? What kind of sacrifice does it come with? And people share is one of the keys to success in life, coinciding with short steps and long vision. And are you willing to t step into that and sacrifice what you need to sacrifice to get to that point? And uh, uh, here, halfway through the show, uh, we're going to be taking some callers if we have time, right? Yes, correct. If we have time, we're going to take some callers. People are starting to interact with our podcast, which is awesome. A lot of people are getting some traction with what we have to say and getting our thoughts on things, not to say we're the end-all, be-all, but we're just a different way of helping you think for yourself. Um, I also want to say thank you to all of our listeners here. Uh, we're going to be sharing some comments from our YouTube channel. So if you want to go to our YouTube channel and review some of our podcasts we've done in the past, we just might feature you in your comment on a particular uh, subject that we've done. So uh, if we can go my screen real quick and maybe we can show some of them. Um, here's some comments from our YouTube channel. Uh, it says, hey Matt, uh, you're a man of faith as am I and we have the same name, his name is Matthew. Okay, what's the chance of getting you to mentor me? So very, very good question, which by the way, this Thursday, if you are unaware of it, we have a Cigars, Wealth and Whiskey event Happening in uh, where's where's that? Uh, here you go. We go to that uh, website here. So uh, we have a cigars, wealth, and whiskey event. Hang out with us. It's a one-person day event here in Plano, Texas. It's fifty dollars for a ticket. If you want to hang out with our special VIP section with myself and a couple of my celebrity guest, uh, um, what would you say, uh, whiskey connoisseurs and cigar mm -hmm. aficionados, and we're gonna have a roundtable discussion 
to coach and mentor you to the next level. And it's 150 bucks, but you in a special VIP section. So 50 bucks to get in, network with other um, attendees. But if you want to have specific conversation with myself and the VIP guests I've invited, it's 150 bucks to get into the VIP section. It's kind of it's kind of nominal to get in there. I'm is thinking it, about is this. Is it for the people watching right now who are curious about it? Is it late to sign up and get into no. the VIP section? No, no, it's not. No, it's not too late. So go to events.livingmoneysmart.com. We'll put the link here in the in the uh, in the comment section. Events.livingmoneysmart.com. It is not too late because people are asking for mentorship. People are asking for guidance. Yeah. And guess who's going to be there too as well? Milton will be there too as well. Yeah. Uh, lighten it up, so to speak. And uh, I bought my ticket. Yeah, you bought. Look I bought it. a ticket. Well, you bought a ticket. I bought a ticket. Check you out, man. Check, <laughs> check you. I appreciate that. All right. Yeah. Um, a. IG and Reel and YouTube short that's just taken off on our on our YouTube channel is this reaction to it to car dealerships. Remember we did this a few podcasts ago. Yeah. About what car dealerships don't want you to know because people are constantly just getting new cars, new cars, new cars. The second largest purse for a lot of people in their entire life is cars, and this is a major depreciation, major depreciating asset, and also one of the largest things that you borrow on that instead of let's say. Buying a fifty thousand dollar car mm-hmm. with interest over a four or five year period, you're actually paying eighty thousand dollars for the car and a depreciating asset. So we did a reaction to that, and here's some of the reactions we got. I've owned four cars in my twenty eight years of driving, all Toyotas. They died around three hundred fifty thousand miles. We'll never buy another car. And what was our or was our comment to that? Our comment was, how come people are buying brand new cars just because it's forty fifty thousand miles? Yeah. People think, oh man, it's old. It's old. Yeah. Well, this person here. On our YouTube channel, thank you for uh, your comment. IQ list one nine. They're driving cars up to 100,000, 200,000, in this case, 350,000 miles. Why buy a brand new car? That's our justification. You can redirect the, that money back into your savings and investments or into your own business to help you accumulate more cash. Uh, remember, I sh- shared with you, I was a Jiffy Loop hood tech. I recall. And that was my observation. He says, yeah. I worked as a Jiffy Loop hood tech as well, and he has one 10,000% accurate on the engine bay. Statement. Reason why? Because we pop open hoods of a of an American made car, leaking. I like, how many how many old changes is this? Right? We look in the odometer, first one. We pop open a hood of a Toyota or a Honda, so oh, it's clean, no yeah. leaks. We look in there, how many miles in this car? Hundred thousand miles. So fellow G F Loop Hood Tech, thank you, Ryler Richter, eight oh four, for your comment. A couple of things too as well, you know, uh, in support of what we're doing. Thanks for y'all. Uh, do man, keep it coming. 100 percent ownership. This is from our last podcast. 100 yeah. percent ownership, having values as a man, being provider, protector, leadership for men. So, uh, what's awesome. your thoughts on these comments? People are, are responding back to our podcast. You know, sometimes when when, when you're involved in a specific um, realm of your career, or you start doing something just to bring some light to specific topics, and you don't really see what people are reacting to, how yeah. they're reacting to uh, these topics. So, when you have commentary on what you're doing and it's actually impacting people's lives it's somewhat nice to be able to read that and hear that it's good good yeah. and by the way there's there's other comments there too as well people agree with us you don't agree with us we yeah. welcome oh, both yeah so uh let's jump into our first topic here of a resident doctor doing her thing to become a medical professional and she's done with medical school and now she's a resident and we've always talked about on this show if you want to get ahead financially and if you, if you want god to bless you you have to be willing to do with the least, so therefore you can bless, be blessed with the most. So what is this uh, young lady, what is this uh, up and coming doctor who's in residency right now, what is she doing with her finances? Let's take a look at this clip. I did my paycheck with me as a 26 year old resident doctor living in South Florida. So my monthly too. paycheck after taxes is $4,081. The first that. thing that I do every month is pay all of my bills. I start by paying my rent, which is $2,300. For electricity bills, $80. My my car is paid off, so I only have to pay car insurance, which is $100. And for gas, I budget $80. In terms of my daily living, I budget for groceries $300. For dining now, $150. My subscriptions, $40. And then I budget $150 for miscellaneous. In terms of my health, I... Like to budget for my copays and medications, eighty dollars. My gym membership, which is currently class pass, I pay ninety dollars. Mm-hmm. And then for my physician's disability insurance, I pay a hundred dollars. For my major, student um, loans, I'm currently paying three hundred dollars. Yeah. So my total expenses prior to savings come out to three thousand nine hundred ninety dollars. What I have left over from that is approximately ninety one dollars. I'm currently not contributing anything to my Roth IRA, and all the money that I have left over, which is $91, I put towards my emergency fund. 
You know, I didn't see a lot of there was entertainment, having out, you know, having fun, going out, having a good yeah. time. I didn't see that part. Did, did I miss? Did I? No, no, no. I, I mean, okay. I, I would assume that's one hundred fifty dollars for miscellaneous. Miscellaneous. Right. I mean, I mean, miscellaneous. I mean, and that's the month, month, right? Yeah, it's monthly. It's a lot more. What dinner in one weekend is worth one hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. So, by the way, would you all love to have my budget in terms of the spreadsheet that I use to help my wife and I budget our finances? If you'd like to have. An example of that, please put in the comment section budget, not in the live chat, but also in the comment section when we post this video, put budget, and maybe next week we come back to this podcast and say, hey, go to this website, download my podcast, my uh, budget for free, but if that's a value to put budget, because um, a lot of people just unnecessarily spend a lot of money without even knowing it. How fast is it for you to spend cash? And, you know, I mean, back in the day, we used to feel cash in our pocket. Yeah. Today, we don't feel cash in our pocket. We just have our phones. Yeah, zip, 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 zip. And so, uh, by the way, good for her for being disciplined. You know, if, if you are, we were just talking about it this morning. Uh, we were just talking about credit yeah. because you were just talking about a, uh, uh, t- t- by the way, tell us, catch us up to speed. I want you to share everybody what you, what happens to you. It's good news. It is great news, but it was all scary news if you're, if you're not disciplined. Um, so four years ago, um, when Matt started inviting me out to his events, and he was like, dude, you should come out to Vegas with us. You should come out to uh, Orlando, Miami, all the, all these places so you can, you know, work with our people and, you know, your clients can use you. I mean, sure, yeah. not a yeah. problem. But yeah. then, you know, flights, hotels, Ubers, food, all these things started piling up. And unfortunately, during that time, I wasn't financially in a place that I wanted to be. So mm-hmm. my ass started applying for credit cards. <laughs> and because I still had some remaining student loan debt, a high uh, uh, high payment for my my card, knowing at the time I still had a mortgage, um, my credit wasn't that great. And yeah. I, you know, I've maybe my early to my mid twenties, I was kind of late on some, on some bills cause I couldn't afford it. USC gym wasn't yeah. paying me enough. Yeah. Um, so I applied for a Southwest card. I applied for multiple cards. I can actually get some points and I got denied for every single one of those cards. So yesterday just for shits and giggles around like 11 PM. So four years later, yeah, four years later, yeah. four years later, um, because ha- you got your finances together, you start making more money conscious, more money smart. Correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so four years later, last night, uh, my niece texted me, like, Hey, don't forget you have a baptism to show up to in May. And I'm like, all right, let me go on Southwest and book it now before it gets expensive, right? Yeah. Because I still want to be frugal with my money and not yeah. wait till last minute just because I have it. I don't want to use it. Does that make yeah. sense? So I went on Southwest, and you know how, how you, you pick your flight, your, your, your go, and then you're returning all the way at the bottom. It says, if you apply for this card, you get a $200 credit limit, and instead of paying $297, you only pay $90. Yeah, right. So it's, like like, the, it's like at the Best Buy or a department store. Like If you apply now, get 10% off your purchase. Yeah, so I'm like... Oh, let's try. Yeah. So I applied. I, I mean, again, I just I, I have a bad taste with applying for credit cards, so yeah. I, I really d- don't do it. So I applied, and I put in all my information, personal credit card, right, not business. I applied, uh, implemented all my information, and then it had like a loading screen, loading, yeah. loading, loading, loading. It took a lot longer than than usual. And it's approved. You've been approved for a ten thousand dollar credit line nice. through, for Southwest. Nice, nice. So that's nice. Yeah. But if you don't have to discipline for it, because I didn't have that in my mid twenties, which really fucked me over. Yeah. Um, it's really gonna screw you over. So Matt, yeah. you were you were stating something along those lines. I don't mm-hmm. know who said it. Yeah. But it takes what what yeah. you have what. Yeah. Uh, Yana Vanzant. Uh, she's a she's a life coach, and I remember listening to one of her tapes in the late nineties, early two thousand. She says, to have a big bank account or no big bank account negative bank account, it's a reflection of your consciousness. But your credit report also yeah. is a reflection of your attitude. And oftentimes we look at a credit report, we're gonna sweep it under the rug, sweep it, I don't owe you, nah, 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 nah. but bro, you know, we, we know we owe people. Yeah. You know, we signed a dotted line, we, we checked out. We may not have read the small print, but when you go to open up your cell phone bill, AT&T or T-Mobile or whatever case may be, you know you owe the cell phone company money. When you owe the, uh, you know, you set up your utilities for your apartment, for your house, you know you owe monthly that light bill, that electricity bill, that, that uh, internet bill. And we try to say, okay, we, we slip in this period of, of, of financial laziness and we don't think we have to pay our bills. And that's a dangerous thing because you never want to walk around life. You never walk around your long term. You don't want to rock around people, businesses, and have your reputation that you're not paying your bills. Now, every time the, the, we've done a gotcha book tour, everywhere we've gone uh, uh, on the gotcha book tour, uh, this last two and a half, three months, I've hired local videographers in those specific cities and states. And I know going, if I go back, for example, Memphis, I hired one, we did a good job, I paid him, and we did good work together, he did good work for me. I went back to Memphis and I hired him again. Nice. Um, uh, I went to Miami and Len is a good guy and he's, he's exactly what he says he is. I pay my bills and guess what I do? I send him referrals. Uh, we go to uh, 
the DMV area, Washington, D.C. Trey does a great job. Uh, he hired a hoodie as a subcontractor, and they do a good job. I'm constantly going to be working with these guys again. Not only do I do my job in terms of paying them, but also they do a good job being reliable, dependable, putting out quality of work. Why? That's a reflection of attitude and discipline. So if you ever wonder why your financial situation is not going the right way, and you're not getting the yeses that you need to be and that you feel that you deserve it, double check that, look at, look at yourself in the mirror, and say, what can I do to take ownership of my financial situation so I can improve, just like you did. And I think many more people today, if they take financial ownership of their situation instead of waiting for some savior to financially bail you out, mm. you're gonna be much better ahead uh, financially. And, um, and oftentimes people think, well, I need to go to get more intelligence, I need to get more smarts. No, you just need more common sense. And so one of the common sense areas of making money is do I need a college degree or not a college degree? And you, 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 you got a, a video here of uh, people thinking that, yeah, unless you are studying to be a doctor, like this young lady, doctor, lawyer, scientist, lawyer, yeah. engineer, yeah. Um, scientist, something like that. Uh, we call it STEMs: uh, science, uh, technology, uh, uh, education, engineering, math, yeah. math or medicine, right? And then I'll add L for legal. Yeah, uh, you definitely want to be smart when you. Be, you know, I want to hire a smart lawyer and, yeah. uh, that, that's been educated. So, outside of that, do you really need to go to college? Well, we have got another clip here of yeah. this young lady saying, "Hey, I graduated, I did the part." And then what? Let's take a look at this. Can anyone explain to me how I have two degrees? I have two degrees. Oh, and a certificate. A little extra, right? I have a certificate. May not, may not be a master's, but it's something extra along with the two degrees, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to apply for jobs right now. And um, the thing is, is that the only person I have responding to me is a man from a tech, um, from a tech company saying, hey, you wanna answer some customer service problems? You want to answer some customer service calls? <laughs> no, Bart. I don't want to answer your calls. No, so, no offense, but I'm a little more qualified than to just to be sitting around answering your customer service calls, Bart. Okay. Okay, we can start right there. I'm sorry. So, so she's experiencing life. Hello. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so you might be educated. You might have the right certifications, but she some, said something very key in there. She thinks she's qualified. Yeah. She's educated, but she may. Not be qualified. She may not but, have the experience. And she, right. She may not know how to do customer yes. service. And I've been saying this time and time and time again. You know, oftentimes people have this expectation just because of an education or degree or certification that I expect this job or status or salary. But you have to earn that qualification. Many people graduate college. I mean, Swazo was talking about, yeah, I got, I got my degree as an engineer, but they weren't hiring me because I wasn't qualified as an engineer. Yeah. So... You know, you have a lot of clients that uh, either have college degrees or no college degrees. What's been your feedback as a trainer on uh, boots on the ground? And when, when it comes down to that, it's it, it's a miss of it's misdirection and poor mentorship when it comes down to a 17, 18 year old, 19 year old trying to figure out which direction to go to. And because of that, there are over 44 million borrowers, man, which makes us what? The second highest consumer debt category in the United States, which is student loan debt. And they, they're owing over $1.5 trillion in, as a whole when it comes down to student loans. And for me, um, I went to school for a couple trades, but I only paid around eight to $12,000 in maybe in my skills and technician skills that I needed to, to attain what I'm doing right now. Versus I would have went to school for a different category, college, 40 year degree, and mm -hmm. would have cost me four times the amount. And right now I probably would, still would have been paying it off and wouldn't have gotten hired. And the thing is also, if you have the skills, if you have a specific skill that you can acquire through a small course, through a trade, through a six month trade school, there are over 7 million jobs across the entire country based uh, do, uh, based on what the stats say in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And there's what, I think 6.4 million unemployed people. And most of those unemployed people are people who just graduated college mm -hmm. and can't find a job. Yeah. And one of the things that I've experienced, at least my first two years in college, I did go to college, mm -hmm. I just dropped out. And yep. I was one of the, 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 what, like a small percentage that dropped out and didn't get passed in associates because I just, I didn't see the point of it. Even if you are in college, you're not learning the skills that you need in order for you to be attractive to an employer. That's what, which is why you start at the bottom as a bottom feeder. Mm -hmm. But then I think a lot of college students have a lot of pride. And I think, I don't know if it's an ego thing. I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know if, I'm not sure if it's an ego thing or a pride thing, but... You know, when you're paying $100,000 in, in, in student loan debt to get a degree, yep. 
you know, two to four year degree, and then someone wants to start you off at the bottom, it's almost like a slap in the face because you wasted all that time going to school. Well, Milton, you've been to our conventions, right? Yeah. When you go to our conventions, you're, you're, my, you're, my, you're my security. Uh, you make sure that everybody's health, healthy and fed and make sure they're hydrated. We're doing our uh, two and a half day conferences. Yeah. How much of that audience do you think has a college degree? You have 10,000 people in there. How much of the audience do you think that has a college degree? A really small percentage. Okay, but actually, it's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of people with a college degree. Yeah. Uh, what percent of that has actually student loan debt? Yeah. Uh, practically all of them. Yeah. Uh, we've recruited last year in 2023 over 10,000 people into the Money Smart Movement team. 10,000 people. Yeah. How many of them uh, have a college degree and say, it's not enough for me to financially sustain myself? Yeah. 100% of them. Yeah. All I'm saying is that I'm boots on the ground. We do workshops twice a week on Tuesdays and Saturdays. 100% of the people that come in, they either have a college degree or not have a college degree. And 50% of people have a college degree. 50% don't. So one out of two. And 100% of them say, you know what? My college degree is not enough for me to live in this day and age. Whether I have a master's degree. I have a doctor. She's a Dr. Jennifer Lawrence. She's a neurologist. She's excited about establishing her own financial service insurance business. Because her salary as a neurologist simply isn't enough to create generational wealth. Because you can't transfer a job to the kids you have. But you can transfer business. You can transfer an asset. You just can't transfer a job. So what I'm translating from what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe this might not be the route to take, right? But either A, you keep your job as whatever whatever career you choose, but you live below your means. Yep. And the extra money that you have, you put it into a savings and turn IRA into life insurance policy, and you let it grow slowly. And then you live a comfortable life. Yeah. Or B, you keep that career and you figure out a way to turn that career that into some form of business. Mm -hmm. So if you're a doctor opening up multiple clinics, yep. if you're a kinesiologist opening up your opening up your own practices, yep. if I don't know, uh, what, 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 oh, if you're a lawyer, you know, also opening up multiple offices, have you know lawyers working under you. So there's a way to keep your career and to monetize it and to expand it into something bigger. But then you have to actually learn new skills, which when it comes down to operations and it comes down to actually running a business. Right. Right. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, uh, well, you, to your point, uh, uh, Tim Grover, yeah. who is the personal trainer for Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, he uh, was being laughed at because he's Indian. He's being laughed at by his family. Oh, you're going to do be a manager at LA Fitness. You'll be a manager at the gym. Well, he, he decided to go out there, go on a limb, and recruit players from the Chicago Bulls, recruit players from professional sports, for him to be their trainer. Yeah. Make a long story short, we all know that he f eventually finally landed Michael Jordan. He eventually landed LeBron, uh, uh, Dwayne Wade. He eventually landed Co uh, Kobe Bryant. Many, many athletes after that. But what did he do? He transitioned that even that practice into a business. Mm. So he became an author. He became a, a, a best-selling author. He became a speaker on stage. He's being asked to speak at all these companies. Why? Because he turned that from the job into actually a speaking business, a, 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 a knowledge business where he's packaged up his wisdom on how to help people train. And he does personal training just like everybody else. Yeah. But just like you, he did what? He, he, he monetized his education into knowledge assets. And speaking of monetize, monetization, you, you really need to monetize because guess what got released a couple weeks ago? It was the, com, cause the Consumer uh, Price Index Inflation Report. And guess what this entire year everybody's expecting? The com, uh, inflation's starting to come down. Inflation's starting to come down. Finally, Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman, says we can possibly drop interest rates in 2024, not once, not twice, but three times, if we see inflation starting to go and trend downward. What it has been until two weeks ago. And what happened two weeks ago, it popped from 3.2% back to 3.5%. They're expecting it to go, that get below 3% uh, down to the twos, two and a half. And so if I can share my screen here real quick, um, this is a example of what happens to inflation. So this is 2020, okay? This is a report here from 20. There's some data to share with you guys. This is pre-pandemic, okay? And then the pandemic hits. Inflation goes down. Why? America needed to print cash. America was in a pandemic mode. But guess what happened to price goods and services after 2020? 21, 22, 20, uh, J June, July of 2022, it pops up to 9.1%. Uh, uh, the, the chart's not following me here. Um, the screen's not. There it is. 9.1% as a high in June 2022. But where has it been trending? So it's been trending downward. It's been trending downward. Why? Because they started cutting uh, um, uh, interest rates. And they thought here in 2023, everything's starting to looking good, looking good. 
2023, okay, it's going to start really looking good. But what happened here, let's go here in the last year. Here's what has happened to inflation rates. It's popped back up to 3.5%. It's a little laggy on the, uh, there it is, 3.5% interest rate here the last quarter of 2024. So guess what Jerome Powell is not going to do? Cut interest rates. So for every realtor, homeowner, mortgage, uh, mortgage, mortgage loan officer, uh, investor that you're hoping for lower interest rates in 2024, chances are it's not happening. He's dialing back until we see consecutive quarters of inflation trending back down. Right now, it trended back up. So he's asking, Jerome Powell uh, uh, here said uh, in a quote here, says, um, the recent data has clearly not get, can, can I uh, get off the screen? The recent data have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. So let me ask you, for the general population or for the average person trying to learn, you know, Inflation on, on this topic on inflation. Yeah. How does this affect them, and or, or what should they take away from this? Here's a challenge. Uh, I went to go get a burrito, a healthy burrito, onto Freebird. Yeah. And um, listen, I'm not. I'm 50 years old, but I'm not that old. Old. How, how, I'm just curious. For those of you out there watching this, if you go get a burrito, let's say at Chipotle, you go to uh, what's another place you get a burrito at? Chipotle. Chipotle Freebird. Here in Texas is Freebirds. You know, OMG Tacos is here, yeah. big in Texas. You get a burrito, you get, yeah. I got a chocolate chip cookie and a fountain drink. Yeah. Okay. How much do you think that should cost? How much do you think that should cost? I mean, I, I used to spend eight, nine bucks easy for lunch. How much should a burrito, chicken burrito, a chocolate chip cookie, or maybe even a bag of chips for you guys, and a drink, how much should that cost? Well, I decided to take a picture. Guess what that price ended up to be $17. So that's what inflation means. $17 for a burrito? $17 for a chocolate chip cookie burrito and a fountain drink? Ridiculous. So many people out there, we covered last week that Governor uh, uh, Newsom raged minimum wage to $20 an hour. Guess what's starting to happen in, in California? Fast food restaurants are starting to lay people off. Uh, people that used to work at school cafeterias are leaving those school cafeteria jobs and getting jobs at the fast food or places where they're paying 20 bucks a month, uh, so 20 bucks an hour for serving burgers and, 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 and fries. And guess what's happened to the cost of burgers and fries to the average person that's out there? It's going up. This is what the cost of inflation. This is what the cost of what's going on in our economy today is affecting Bro. the average Joe yeah. to keep them from getting their money ahead. Bro, in early 2009, an average chicken burrito from Chipotle was 485 Damn. and a combo meal would cost around seven dollars. Combo, combo meal, chips, burrito, and a fountain drink. A ten dollar increase. You know, there was another viral video out there of a person going to Five Guys. Yeah, he has twenty one dollars for Five Guys burger, fries, and a drink. Twenty one bucks. And so that's what the higher interest rates are causing. This is what politicians are saying. People are owed fifteen, twenty bucks an hour, trying to force entrepreneurs to force pay their employees a higher wage, which what they're going to do is pass on that cost to other people. But the downside is eventually if nobody wants to work for that restaurant, nobody wants to work for that business, if you can't get people to work for that business, is it worth the risk then for that entrepreneur to set up shop, to set up a restaurant, to risk their money, their energy, their finances, their credit for nobody to help them out? Nobody wants a job because they're leaning on government Guess what a lot of entrepreneurs and creators and producers are going to do? They're going to set up shop somewhere else. Leave this country and say, you know what, it's easier. A good, a good friend of mine who I uh, uh, get my shoes from, guess what he started to do instead of selling shoes here in America? He started selling shoes in Colombia. He's selling shoes Columbia. overseas. And there's a lot, apparently there's a large sneakerhead community in, in, in Southern uh, Latin South, America. South America, huh? Yeah. Really? I, had, I had no idea. Yeah, it's massive. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, Warren Buffett. Cut stock from portfolio. Um, I just want to uh, share this. Uh, can we show my uh, screen here? Warren Buffett cuts this stock here. Um, this is uh, disturbing because it involves a company in the life insurance industry. So uh, he cut the stock from his portfolio, from Berkshire Hathaway, and the stock dropped 53% in one day. That stock, Globe Life. Uh, stock plumbed more than 53% in a single day last week after short seller Fuzzy Panda Research accused the life insurance company of fraud. The claims piled onto the steady 
already struggling stock, which already been a long time holding on Warren Buffett's conglomerate Berkshire Hathaway. So if you think about buying, dipping the stock, here are some things you need to know. So here, here, here's what went down. Okay, here's what went down. The, the management team, if you know anything about Warren Buffett, if he's going to invest in a company, he's investing not in a company, he's investing in the people. If he has confidence in the people, he's going to invest in a company. Even if you're nobody or you're somebody, if he doesn't feel you have high strength and values and principles, he's not investing in you. He's, he's pulling his money and putting it somewhere else. Buffett McMahon's management team's character and trustworthiness when investing. Buffett and his team have an excellent track record of evaluating management, which is a big reason why the conglomerate's long-term success. When Globe Life became the subject of several lawsuits accusing it of misconduct, Berkshire pulled the plug on its investments. Last year, two Globe Life subsidiaries, American Income Life and Arias Agencies, faced a lawsuit accusing them of inappropriate workplace conduct. This includes rampant drug use, wow. sexual abuse, and degradation of agents who didn't hit sales targets. Global life struggles continue when a former executive claimed he was fired for blowing the whistle on potentially illegal sales practices at the subsidiary. It appears that the accusations were why Berkshire sold its stake in Insure, in insure last year. So um, bottom line, guys, these guys were sued because some people said, you know what, these, these guys are doing these things illegally. Uh, uh, rumor has it that they were selling life insurance policies to dead people. Uh, they're finding fake social security numbers and getting the policies issued still. And by the way, usually, guys, this is a big no-no in the life insurance industry. So usually if an agent goes rogue or an agency goes rogue and they write a policy, the life insurance carrier has to underwrite it. They just don't issue a policy just to issue a policy just because at the behest of the insurance agent. They do research. They do a social security check. They do a DMV check to see your driving record. They do a pharmaceutical check to see if you're taking any uh, drugs involving mental health or a heart disease or cancer to make sure you're not lying on the application. Uh, they do things to make sure they do their due diligence and investigate whether or not we should issue somebody a quarter million dollar policy, a five hundred thousand dollar policy, or a million dollar policy, because if the client says uh, gets issued the policy, and the client's only paying seventy bucks a month or hundred bucks a month, but the insurance company's on the hook for a million dollar policy, that could be a huge loss over many, 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 many policies. It could be a massive loss to the insurance carrier. Well, guess what these guys were doing? Allegedly, they were doing just that. They were doing a lot of fraud, and uh, they're taking a lot of shortcuts. And uh, they were trying to leverage the life insurance industry for the opportunity that it is. And guys, I'm in the insurance industry. There are good agents, there are bad agents. Sadly, one of the bad agents and agencies uh, have been exposed. And if a guy like Warren Buffett is willing not to tolerate this or not willing to stick with them for the long term and cuts this stock, that should be potentially a reflection of what this insurance company is all about. I, I, put, on, I'm, I put it on Twitter, I put it on social media the other day. I said AIG, uh, AIL agents, Global Life agents reach out because imagine the good agents that are at Globe Life, the good agents that weren't part of this riffraff, they weren't part of this mismanagement, they weren't part of this drug use and uh, you know, uh, and poor behavior just because your agents don't hit sales targets. They're probably looking for a new home. They're probably looking for a new new place to not have their CEO and their president and one of the top guys be a distraction to building their their own business. So if you're looking out there for a new home insurance agent of AIL and Globe Life reach out, you don't deserve this, but for those of you that are representing our industry in a poor way, it's only eventually the time you're gonna be exposed. This industry is so highly regulated, even if you get away with it in a short period of time, eventually you will be exposed. You know, Bible says that even, even, even sin, you know, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, that eventually sin, what you do in darkness will eventually come to light. And if there's any sin that evolves, that, that King Solomon and, 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 and the, the areas of concern are around is around the areas of of recognition around the areas of money it's around the title uh, around getting certain titles because you want to test a man give him money if you really want to test a man give him money and power and guess what these guys just got tested with both of those so my takeaway obviously i'm not from from the life insurance industry and i'm not extremely familiar with it i know like basic kindergarten but business, information. Is business though right yep. so my biggest takeaway from what you just spoke about is shortcut wins don't last Whenever you try to take shortcuts in business that's going to screw people over or uh, what do they say, rig the system, mm -hmm. it's not, it, it may, you may get some short form outcome and a small win, but eventually if you're not following the, the principles that you need to follow in order to have a successful business that's going to outlast, I guess, the, the valleys, right, mm -hmm. the, the, the fog, the storms, if you're following the incorrect path, and not abiding by the principles, you're going to get exposed eventually. And that's when everything just starts imploding from the inside out and your reputation as a business, as a person, also gets carried down with it. 
to, to balance yeah. this out to continue the rest of the article, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. To continue the rest of the article, if you go back to the screen, uh, Globe Life responded to these allegations. He said, we reviewed the report and found it to be widely misleading, mixing anonymous allegations with recycled points pushed by plaintiff law firms to coerce Globe Life into settlements. The short sale analysis by Fuzzy Panda Research mischaracterizes facts and uses substantiated claims, unsubstantiated claims and conjecture to present an overall picture of Globe Life that is deliberately false, misleading, and defamatory. Uh, so is the opportunity. So people are wondering, do I buy the dip? Do I stick with this company uh, long term? A lot of people on the fly, according to the fly, uh, their response to this is serves to assuage concerns, but does not completely remove the vacuum that remains absent a broader communication about this matter with the investment community. So um, Evercore, we've worked at Evercore before here uh, at PHP. Um, their opinion says significantly uncertainty for the shares. Uh, guys, there's a lot of solid life insurance companies out there that don't, that don't do this riffraff. Um, I'm of the school of thought that if you build your business on the right values and principles, it might take you longer to be successful. The guys that want to cut corners, the guys that want to uh, uh, um, take shortcuts, will they get ahead faster? Yes, they will. But eventually they get caught. Eventually they get found and their business is no longer. You have to figure out yourself what you want to do. And if you uh, are looking at this, uh, by the way, that's the downside of FOMO, the fear of missing out. Yeah. Fear of missing out on what? You know, what, what are you fear of missing out on, on what? Because even if you take action on a fear of missing out on something that isn't built on solid foundation, values and principles and established practices, you're not missing out on anything. Long term, you're going to be much, much further ahead. Do you think uh, younger people have more FOMO than, or do you think older people have more FOMO? I think, I think younger people do. I think younger people have a lot more FOMO. I had FOMO when I was in my 20s, uh, early 30s. Um, I felt FOMO because people were getting involved in real estate and mortgages, and I wasn't. I stuck with the insurance industry, and a lot of these guys got hurt in 07, 09, Great Recession. A lot of these guys, the guy, a lot of these guys uh, got hurt during the pandemic, uh, during the flash crash, but uh, the insurance business every time, it was just slow and steady for me. It might be a different scenario for everybody else, but uh, during tough times in our economy, my life insurance and retirement planning business using uh, uh, fixed and permanent um, in index life insurance strategies have stood the test of time. So we've got to figure out what you want to do. And, and uh, you know, the life insurance industry is a very solid industry. So I'm very, again, I'm very surprised why these guys slipped through the cracks, but eventually they got found out. So uh, we got some time to uh, take some calls if you want to. Sure. You want to queue up? You want to queue up some calls? Um, but this, uh, uh, I, I want to share this one thing too as well. So, can we go to the uh, can we go to the YouTube video where this uh, former, I don't know, former presidential candidate? It's got some pretty interesting thoughts with it. But but everybody in America should have. Robbie, Wallace. our birthright should be this: you are born, you deserve a home, and it should be paid for. There should be no taxes. Any debt that you've got should be canceled. You should have free health care. You should have at the highest level. You should have free education at the highest level, and you should have ten thousand dollars per month. <laughs> By the way, I know Rico Suave. I was in his podcast a, a few years ago. What do you guys think of that? Free healthcare at the highest level. Free education at the highest level. Ten thousand dollars a month. You should have a free house. No debt. Wow, sounds great, but very, very misleading. By the way, so attractive though. What an what an attractive message. You know, you think about things like that. You think about th those type of scenarios. And that's where we can't get caught up because eventually at the end of the day, that message is so seductive, but there's always something attached to something free versus earn. Yeah. I'd rather you earn things. Why, why do you want to earn things? Even though it's tough, even though it's difficult, even though it's expensive, even though it's costly, why should you earn things? Because then you value things. You get things for free. Guess what you don't value? Guess what has more of an upkept community, a community of renters or a community of owners? Guess who got better lawns? Guess who keeps their house maintained? Guess who makes sure their garbage is taken care of? Guess who makes sure that there's less crime in a neighborhood? A community of renters or a community of owners? Why? Why do you, te why do you, why do you ask yourself this question? When's the last time you rented a rental car? And before you turned in a rental car, did you change the oil? Hmm. Did you uh, take it for a car wash? Uh, tell, me, tell me the truth. Did you, did you hit the gas? Hit the, hit the brakes really hard? Were you, were you dogging out that car? You know why you were doing that? We well, didn't take care of it because you're renting it. Yeah. But if it was yours, it's a baby. Was it pristine, clean all the time? Of course. You, why? Because you own it. So what's your thoughts on Big Dog? You ready? Oh, yeah. Oh, we want to take a call? 
Yeah, I, so we have three people who want to call in, but whatever we have time for, maybe one or two. Okay. It's completely up to you. Let's take a call. I'm going to put the first one on speaker. Sure. It's all yours, brother. It's for okay. you. That question's for you. Uh, uh, Justin J Rodriguas. Justin, how you doing, buddy? Where are you calling from? What's up, man? What's up? This is actually uh, Justin Rodriguez. I'm calling from Chicago, man. Shy town. By the way, uh, congratulations to uh, Angel Reese uh, of the WNBA. She got drafted from LSU. So now you got uh, a superstar there in Chicago. We got some good talent over here, man. It's, it's going to be exciting to see him over here. For sure. For sure. How, how can we help you, brother? For sure, man. For sure. I absolutely love the show. Thank you guys for giving Thank me you. the opportunity to be here. And uh, just got a, a good question, and I'm, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say about uh, what does what do you guys feel is ne a necessity to survive financially for married couples today in a, in a world full of inflation, man? Everything's been, been crazy in the market, so uh, I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on that. If you don't, ask me, if you don't mind me asking you, Justin, uh, what do you do for work? Uh, I'm actually in real estate. You're in real estate? Okay. By the way, how's, how is the real estate market in Chicago, you know, based on everything that's going on in the economy and uh, everything with the NAR, the NAR settlement, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so as of right now, the real estate market currently sits, I mean, again, it, it really is subjective to whoever um, the real estate agent, loan officer, whoever it might be, but uh, the market's really hot. I mean, there's not a lot of inventory over here in Chicago. Wow. So it's caused for a lot of multiple offer situations, even with the uh, higher interest rates. Yeah. The CPI report came back higher than expected, so interest rates have shot up over the last couple, uh, over the last week. Um, but even with that, man, it's still most proper situation. So it's pretty crazy over here in Chicago. Well, that's good, bro. What's 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 the hot markets there in Chicago? Uh, north side, south side, burbs. Um, yeah, I mean, it, usually the burbs are always going to be hot because after COVID, a lot of people started migrating to the suburbs. So they um, obviously people working from home, not a lot of people working downtown, which caused people to move to the suburbs. Um, but you're looking southern parts of Chicago, um, even on the north. I mean. I have clients everywhere, man. I got people in the western western suburbs. I got people in the north side and south side. And every single time we've put an offer over the last two weeks, it has been multiple offers. Crazy. There's been one time where they're just like, okay, yeah. They accepted good. offers. So it's been, it's been a pretty crazy market. Man, good for you. Good for you, Justin. So a good continued success. Uh, keep separating yourself from everybody out there. So uh, let me go into answering your question here. So uh, for those of you that are wondering what to do for a married couple to do, on their on their finances, especially in their high inflationary period, the first thing you guys got to do is get on the same page with your spouse. Get even more clarity about what you got to accomplish in the next one, three, five years. I'm spoiled because my wife and I, we get together constantly because we have business plans, we have business goals, and we were in business together. But for those of you that aren't in business together with your spouse, you may not be working together with your spouse like my wife and I do. Come back to a, a meeting on a Saturday or a Sunday morning or whatever, on Wednesday night, you have to have a meeting regularly with your wife. For those of you who are dating out there, not married yet, get in the same, same, same situation with your potential new spouse because some potential red flags may come up and you may not want to deal with this when you are married. And we're going to show a clip here in a second about what happened when a guy got married and his wife got exposed to his savings account. But you got to get on the same page. You got to be clear about what you want to accomplish in the next one, three, five, seven years, 10 years, what's going to look like in 20 years, what your family's going to look like, what type of citizens you're going to create to make an impact in your community. What type of children you want? Are they going to be sports? Are they going to be in academics? So you got to figure out what is that family going to look like? The same thing I would do is very clear, be very clear in controlling your income because all great financial plans will fail. All investments will fail. All real estate will fail if you drop your income or the income drops you. So if you have a job and that's only your income, you're in the most vulnerable position financially speaking. If you're a self-employed person, you're a lawyer, and you make your money just by charging uh, legal fees to go to court, you are the most exposed. If you're an insurance guy, you're a real estate guy, if you're a personal trainer like Milton was, if 100% of your income comes from you having to trade time for services or, try, or time for products, you are the most financially exposed person in the economy today. So got to get on the, the capacity to, to expand your ways of earning income. Do I go from a one-man operation to a five-man operation to a 10-man operation? Uh, maybe Justin might want to become a broker and he yeah. wants to uh, recruit agents that work for him because it looks like he needs to do some recruiting. Correct. Uh, if it's a hot market, do you want to go out there to the river of life and river opportunity with a fishing pole or do you want to establish fish nets? Mm. And you'd be established fish nets by creating a business, by scaling from one operation to a 10 man operation. The third thing is save your cash. Don't do any big purchases in terms of, I don't know, and, and by the way, purchase of investment real estate. Invest in real estate, especially right now if you feel you can deal with a monthly um, uh, uh, a mortgage. But big purchases, I put those on pause. 
Big vacations where you spend tons of t- tens of thousands of dollars on, on we've seen people do that. Put those on pause. Guys, I've been to Disneyland and Universal Studios. I can't believe just for me and four kids, it was three thousand dollars just for us to get through Disneyland with a fast pass. So it's crazy how much it takes for vacation. You have a form of staycation, create some local memories in some local areas. You know, visit local spots there in the Chicagoland area for a vacation. Get to know what the Chicagoland area in the Midwest is really all about, where former steel mills and what the stories mm-hmm. were of those communities and where some of the hotbeds are. Even on the South Loop, there's a lot of history in the South Loop of Chicago. So those are the things I would, would encourage everybody to do is keep your money tight, maximize your opportunities, maximize your cash flow, expand your cash flow, be in charge of income. Why? Whoever's in charge of income is in control of your life and what you do in your life. So make sure you're in tr- you can charge and you control of that. Hopefully that answers your question, Mr. Uh, Justin uh, Rodriguez. You got time for two more? We got, uh, we got, time, we got time for, for one, one more. more. We got time for one more. All right, fantastic. Here you go. It's directly for you. Cool. For me? Okay, yep. cool. So uh, who's this? Andra. 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 Andra, how are you? Welcome to the San Francisco Squad podcast. Hi. Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Um, Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Appreciate um, so I'm also from Chicago. Shy town. Um, I currently work in finance in the real estate industry as well. Um, and I know you guys usually talk about all the steps that you need to um, develop and utilize to make it to the next step. But I was kind of wondering on the opposite side, how do you handle um, the negative, the negative side, the imposter syndrome, especially when more opportunities and success comes into your life? Um, I feel like that usually comes in when you're making that next big step and yep. trying that new venture. So, any advice for those making that next step, and how do either of you deal with it? Um, yeah, it'd be great to Ta- give us some insight. Sure, Andrew. Tell me about the imposter syndrome. How do you define that? Um, the doubts that come up, even if you have the experience um, and the accomplish, accomplishments behind it. Oh, oh, so it's really a self thing. So, so there's two different types of failure: fear of, of, of fear, of, you know, fear of, of of failing, and then you have fear of success. Do you, what do you think you deal with more: fear of failure or fear of success? Um, personally, now I think it's more the failure of success. Dead. Interesting, interesting. Andrew, you, 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 by the way, you share a very compelling question here, and, and I, I want to share my thoughts on this. Th- thank you, Andrew, for, for being the show. Let me answer it. Um, one of the things that a lot of people have, especially, Andrew, if you're in a multicultural community and how you're raised, it's all about one thing. You know what that one thing is called? Identity. Identity. The self-worth, the self-esteem, the self-confidence that you are worth it. Maybe that be, might be that might be the imposter that she's dealing with. Am I really deserving of this? And I tell you right now, if you've been busting your tail, if you've been rising up and established on the right values and principles of, of, of merit, of you doing your job, of you creating a reputation, you doing what you say you're going to do, and people are elevating you and promoting you, you've earned it. You deserve it. In terms of imposters, well, maybe other people may not think you deserve it. Maybe they may be jealous of your work. Maybe they be envious of your work. But I'm just telling you right now, if you are being elevated because of your hard work and your genuine nature of doing and following through and doing the job, embrace it. That's you. And by the way, more power to you, more, more amplification to your success. And think about this too as well. If you continue to rise and it's based on the right values and principles and the right, right motives, guess what? You're going to be inspiring a lot of other women to, to rise up to as well with you. You're going to inspire a lot of men to, to rise up with you, encouraging a lot of other people to see you now as a leader, maybe not been perceived as a leader down, you know, in the past, but now down the road, Guess what? You have that opportunity to have that shot. So, continued success to you. Uh, a couple, a couple of book recommendations for you to, to, to read. Anything on John Maxwell? Anything John Maxwell? Great books to read in terms of raising your identity. Anything Les Brown? Read books on identity. He always talk about. There's greatness within you, right? And by the way, we just launched a, a YouTube video of us masterminding with Les Brown backstage at an event that you were a part of mm-hmm. called Escape. The Matrix. So, uh, Andrew, continued success to you, and I appreciate you calling the Seven Fear Squad podcast. Yeah, cool. These are, these are good, man. Yeah, those are very good questions. Very good yeah. questions. Uh, let's dispel some myths. Let's let's, uh, let's let's wrap up with that, and then uh, maybe if we got time, we'll squeeze in what this quick reaction is of this guy who uh, got his savings spent down. So, we're going to do sure. a, do some myths real quick. Let's do it. Let's All do right. one quick myth, which is the six meals a day really boost your metabolism. Mm-hmm. You were telling me in the restaurant that you were 
uh, once told that in order for you to boost your metabolism or gain the weight that you need oh, to gain. Oh, because I've always been skinny. Right. You need to eat six meals a day. Yeah, for, and, for me to gain weight. And what was your question to me on that? Do, do, I, do, do I need to eat six meals a day to gain weight? No. You're, the biggest thing that people, the misconception is, let's just say you're trying to gain weight. And you, you need to consume around, I don't know, 3,000 calories. By the way, my wife hates me when, hates when I ask this question. Why, why is that? <laughs> She's like, you've always been skinny. <laughs> don't ever ask that question around me again. <laughs> so with this, be- before I get into what I'm going to say, I want you guys to understand that I do have the sites. I do have the references. And I do have the data to back it up. It's not just an Instagram post type of commentary. It is this backed up by science. And it has been debunked multiple times by actual researchers. When people say, oh, I'm going to research, they say they mean Google. That's not research. Actual research involves a lot of studies and involves a lot of lab work and involves um, a, a mass amount of people doing the specific task in order to see the outcome for each individual person to see if it's an actual, if the, if what, if the, the statement that's being made is factual, does it work, does it not work? Yeah. So I want to read a couple things. I want to fall into a small 25 second, 30 second rabbit hole. And then I'm going to tell you guys what to actually look out for to actually attain the outcome that you want when it comes down to your food and your eating. So when asked, when multiple physicians were asked, does six meals a day actually increase your metabolism? After multiple studies, you can find this on NCBI, on, Pub, on PubMed, on all these researcher websites. They concluded that increasing meal frequencies from three to six meals per day has no significant effect on 24-hour fat oxidation, but may increase in the desire to eat. The reason why a lot of people push the idea of consuming six meals a day, because a lot of these people are bodybuilders. This started in the mm. bodybuilding world. Oh, so okay. now if you're in the bodybuilding world and you're consuming, I don't know, let's just say three to 4,000 calories a day, two, 300 grams of protein a day, Damn. three to 400 grams of carbs a day, and maybe around 100 to 200 grams of fats a day. It's going to be extremely hard to break down 4,000 calories, 3,000 calories in just two to three meals. Extremely hard because you're going to feel like crap, lethargic, exhausted, and you're going to have stomach issues, mm-hmm. which is why they break down, they break those meals down amongst five to six meals so it's easier to digest and easier to consume. So when it comes down to the, 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 the bro science fact that eating six meals a day actually boosts metabolism, that is completely, completely false. So now let me give you a little bit more science. The premise behind eating smaller and more frequent meals is the control of blood sugar, which is also called blood glucose. This refers to the glucose, a type of sugar that is extracted from the food that we eat. When digestion is complete, glucose is carried by the bloodstream and through the body to supply our cells and organs with energy. When blood glucose levels drop, hunger and cravings spike. By eating six meals per day, the thinking goes, you're ensuring that the blood glucose is available at all times. By controlling the trigger for cravings, you'll eat less and you won't be as likely to give in to siren to the siren song of the bag and chips and the chocolate bar. So we talk about I love chocolate bar. People assume, right? <laughs> the more you eat, the less likely you'll have you'll be hungry, so the less you'll indulge. Sure, that makes sense when it comes down to reducing your appetite because you're eating six meals a day, you won't have the room or the desire to eat crappy food versus only eating two to three times a day. So while the logic is solid, results have been definitely mixed. So final study, three studies here back to back, folks. Participants in a study who ate six meals show no metabolic advantage over the ones who only ate three large meals. What did separate them from the three meal group was that they reported higher levels of hunger and an increased desire to consume food. So my suggestion to you and my push to you guys is to stop listening to these Instagram gurus. Now, here are four things that you need to keep in mind when it, when it comes down to your metabolism. And for the full in-depth information, I'll drop it in the comment section below and I'll also have it on my Instagram page. Four things is you need to understand energy balance when it comes down to calorie surplus, calorie deficiency, and calorie balance. You need to understand the role of your metabolism, aka your BMR, your physical activity, how physical activity affects your your your, your calorie uh, your, your calorie expenditure, and also what we call in the fitness world and the health world, TEF, thermic effect of food, because people who consume more protein, their body utilizes I think twenty or thirty percent more of the calories in their body because it takes a lot more energy to digest the food versus consuming fats. That's why eating high protein diets help you quote unquote utilize more energy or quote unquote uh, uh, burn fat because uh, more pr- more protein uh, uh, um, uh, consumption you have, the more energy your body utilizes to digest that protein, which then you use more energy, more calories, and then you, over time you lose more you know more weight. 
understanding what boosting your metabolism means when in reality there's no such thing as boosting but it is such thing as adapting your metabolism will adapt based on the environment that you put it in when it comes down to physical activity your sleep your rest and also the food consumption that you consume and then understanding the final biggest thing is implementing the strategies and these will these four i will name out is in order to be able to implement all this you need to be able to monitor your caloric intake you need to be able to increase your physical activity you need to adjust your diet, not understanding how many calories you're burning, how many calories you're consuming on a daily basis, what your BMR, what your BMR is, and have a consistent review and adjustment every two, three weeks, so that way you are able to go on the, you can be on, on on the road to either a losing the weight that you want to lose or gaining the muscle that you want to gain. But as far as six meals boosting your your metabolism, that's complete BS. That's been bunked for the last couple of years with actual freaking science. Good man. So uh, love this. Spelling these myths because uh, these can get you to your goals, and uh, especially with the summer summertime rolling around. Yeah, uh, it's the springtime rolling around yeah. uh, now, yeah. so you'll get in shape here by uh, May June. Uh, let's see if we can squeeze this one last thing in here, uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, this husband is befuddled about what his wife did with his savings account. Let's take a look. When I was 16 years old, I started saving my money. 16. I still do that to this day because if something ends up happening, I will have the money to fix it immediately. Six years ago, I met my wife in college. Around two years ago, she found out about my savings account. And that's when things kind of got weird. She tells me that she wants to start saving as well. And I'm like, cool, let's do it. As the months went on, she kept putting into the savings account and I was putting into the savings account until last year when she graduated. When I checked the savings account, I was appalled. Hold on, what, what's going on? Because when my wife started to put in, there was 223,000. So that means when we started putting in together, it got up to 250,000. But when it got to that, she takes out all of the money and pays off her student loans. I was absolutely dumbfounded. I was flabbergasted. I was appalled at the situation because I couldn't believe that she would take out all the money without asking me and pay off her student loans. And then she says to me with a straight face, it's our money. What's our money? Out of the 250,000, you might have put in 10. 10? You might have put in 10. I've been saving my money since I was 16 years old. Oh my For the God. last year and a half, I've been garnishing 75% of my wife's paycheck. So am I the a-hole for taking 75% of my wife's money? No, you're not an a-hole, but you're also a dumb hole for allowing her access to your savings account. You know, there's, there's a conversation you have to have with your wife before you get married. Anybody here, you got to have this conversation with your wife, your spouse, before you get married. And the, I recommend you set up three accounts. Okay, three accounts. Number one, your account that she don't touch. By the way, if you want her to have access to it, I wouldn't have her access to it. She can see it, but not have access to it. Second one is her account. Money she earns at her salary. Do you see it? Sure. But do you have access to it? No. And there's money that you have together. Our account. So what you did is you attached her. And for everybody needs to know, if you are attached as a joint account holder on that account, that person not only has access to it, viewing it, but I have access to it, withdrawing it. And so 16 years old, he's been saving his money, bro. I'm heartbroken for him. I'm, I'm so heartbroken for this guy. And the, the thing that she robbed him of was the compounding rate of return that money could have made for another 16 years. Yeah. And, and another 10 years after that, another 10 years after that, she robbed him of that because she didn't have a clear conversation with him why she was doing when she was doing it. She basically, I think, she, in my opinion, she stole from her husband. Yeah. And he earned that. He built that before they got married. So, in my opinion, it's his. And then it's not ours unless he allows you in it to be ours. But then again, the flip side to that, he added her on as a joint account holder, which makes it ours. He gave her permission. He gave her permission. So, in this, in this point in time, maybe not right now in your situation, but if you were in this position, what would you have done? After you found out and she, the money was already gone. I mean, I'm not, I mean, you're not going to divorce your wife over money. Yeah. But garnishing 75%, I mean, let's say she quits her job the next day. Right? Yeah. Um, would say she doesn't want to pay you. Yeah. Is that going to be an area of contention? Is it going to be an area of conflict? So you've added another layer of complexity into your marriage because it wasn't a clear conversation with your future wife before that happened. You know, when I got married to my wife, you hear, you've heard this song all the time. We yeah. went to the Italian restaurant, clear sheet of uh, a white paper. Put down all my money and all my problems. 
So, babe, going forward, do you want to deal with this? This is what I got. She goes, okay, cool. I got this. She had my back. Same thing with Sheena. She shared with all her assets, her finances. There's never, there's never been an area of lack of clarity with them. Now, we've argued about who should get the money, where should the money go, mm. but it's never been a lack of, okay, is your my mom, there's jealousy, et cetera, et cetera, when it came to that. But I feel bad for this guy. He did the right thing by saving money. By the way, brother, if you're out there, reach out to me. Let me show you how to get that money back. We need to get you as an entrepreneur. We need to get your own business started. Somehow, some way, man, we need to help accelerate and, or in this case, recoup what you've earned. And if you want to involve your wife in that business and have her earn her keep back and... I just don't think that garnishing 75%, you know, you're not, you're not her yeah. boss. Yeah. You know, you're not, you know, the government. Yeah. So I just could think it's going to be a bad move going forward. She's going to complain to him about this and this and that. And it's always going to be a area of, hey, you know what? Well, you spent down all of her savings account, blah, blah, blah. You owe me this. You owe me that. It's never be good to be in a relationship where now that she feels she owes him or he feels he owes her. Bad. I, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of men, women too, but a lot of men need direction on how to pick the right women, man. No, oh my I gosh. Think that's the biggest Clear, concise questioning before you get into any form of relationship. And I think that's one of the areas that I personally struggle with. You know what? You've you've, you've, uh, inspired me. Yeah. I'm going to come up with a a video with 10 questions you should ask your girlfriend, your fiance, before getting married. As an entrepreneur or just as a regular? As a guy. As as a a dude. As a guy in general. As a dude. As a guy. Whatever you build, own business or not. We got a job. We make 20 grand a year, $10,000 a year, or a million dollars a year. Here are 10 questions you should ask. I'm going to come up with 10 questions you should ask your future spouse about money before. You ask her to marry you before you say yes at church. You make that video, and then you create a template with the 10 questions. Yes, I will. And have guys download it, and they can send it out to their prospects. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great way, man. I love it. That's I love awesome. By the way, would that be a value to you? So budget, if you want us to create a budget for you, for you to follow, or in this case, 10 questions for your future spouse. By the way, women should be asking their future husbands these questions too as well, because today women just are much as ballers in terms of finances as mm-hmm. guys can because... Hey, this is capitalism, this is entrepreneur, doesn't care if you're young, you're old, you're male, female, who you pray to, who you decide to marry. Opportunity is out there for those who decide to take ownership of their situation. So last but not least, guys, if you want to get some merch, we just open up our store. Go oh, to shop.sevenfiguresquad.com, yeah. shop.sevenfiguresquad.com. If you want some merch, we have our gotcha shirts, Faith Made Millionaire, sh- Faith Made Millionaire shirts. We have Seven Figure Squad shirts. We have some hats. We got some hoodies. Go check out shop.sevenfiguresquad.com. So with that being said, Milton, appreciate you. Great podcast. With that being said, subscribe, like, drop your comments below. You agree with us? You don't agree with us? Please put it in the comment section below. That being said, next Wednesday, we'll see you here. The Seven Figure Squad podcast, 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. Tune in again. Continue to smart. Continue to smart and be mighty smart today.